As I mentioned in my prayer, uh, we've just completed 10 days of prayer here at Calvary. Uh, A few weeks ago, I asked for people to commit to praying according to the prayer guide. There were 10 days of prayer, and dozens of people came and stood here at the front and back the aisles uh, saying that they would pray, and I, I know that you have prayed, and I just thank you for your faithfulness and your participation in uh, the 10 days of prayer, and I believe that God is going to make a difference. And just before that, we uh, had five weeks of uh, war room, small groups, and in our studies, the messages were based on uh, the theme of prayer. And uh, I believe that God's going to do much for us in regard to answered prayer. Our, Our strongest desire is to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and to make disciples for Jesus, and that's His will. And so we can have confidence that he's going to do what he wants to do. And we want to line up with him and be the people of God that he wants us to be. (coughs) These 10 days that we've just completed were selected because they align with the 10 days that the apostles were in the upper room in Jerusalem. Jesus had told the disciples just before he ascended, just a couple verses before the scripture tells us that he ascended, uh, Jesus said to the the apostles uh, to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit was given to them as, as, uh, as God had promised, and they were not to leave the city until that time. And so for 10 days, now they didn't know when they went uh, there to the upper room, how long it would be, but they went there and in obedience to God, uh, were there in prayer, and uh, they, they, they prayed during that time. And then at the conclusion of the 10 days uh, was Pentecost Sunday, and, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit came and, and met with them. And so uh, as we look at Acts chapter 2 today, uh, we want to see how the, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and the days that followed him. The Holy Spirit is at work in the world today, and, excuse me, and in the lives of those who will follow Jesus. Our message today is God's Spirit poured out, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. I want to read verses 1 through 4. Excuse me. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so this morning we want to talk about God's Spirit poured out. And and I want to begin by just kind of introducing you to the Holy Spirit, uh, meet the Holy Spirit, and and to to, uh, see some of the things that Scripture tells us about the Holy Spirit. First of all, He is the third person of the Trinity, and everything that we know about God is true of the Holy Spirit. Uh, He is one of the three persons that makes up what we refer to as the Godhead. Now, the word Trinity does not, is not in the Bible. It's a theological term to explain God as three persons. And uh, some people say, well, if the word's not in the Bible, why do we not use it? Because the concept is in the Bible. Uh, there are a number of places where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are mentioned together. And since we're doing baptism today, one of the key places where we see that is at the baptism of Jesus. Jesus was being baptized. He was God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel. He was God with us in the body, and he was baptized. And when he was baptized, it tells us that God the Father spoke, and he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, and the Holy Spirit descended as a dove down upon Jesus. And so right there in that one little passage, we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, and it's always listed that way. So the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. We, we see the same thing in Genesis chapter 1, where in the act of creation, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all involved in creation. 
It, it tells us uh, that, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the very next verse, it talks about the Spirit being hovering over the water. And in John uh, chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1, it tells us that Jesus made the world. The Apostle Paul tells us that also uh, in uh, several of places in his writings, that, that everything was created by him and for him. And so we see that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit together. And I'm, I'm laying that groundwork because I, I just want to tell you some of the things that the Holy Spirit is not. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. Uh, sometimes people talk about the Holy Spirit as, as, as if uh, that he's a thing. He's not a thing. He's not it. You know, we, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit in terms of in, inanimate objects. He is a person. He is, he is part of God, and we need, to, uh, we need to be able to have a relationship with him. He's not an experience. Sometimes people kind of uh, talk about the Holy Spirit as, as if the Holy Spirit is, is an experience. He's not an experience. He's not an emotion. Now, we can have an experience with the Holy Spirit as a person. We can have an experience with him, and it may evoke emotions in us. We have an emotional response, but that's true with a person. But he is not the experience, and he is not the emotion. He is a person with whom we interact, which may give us an experience and may bring emotion as a response to his presence with us. And Jesus and Paul, and Paul together introduce to us the Holy Spirit. First of all, we see the Holy Spirit as our counselor, comforter. If you're familiar with some of the older translations of the Bible, in the King James Version of the Bible, that was written in 1610, it describes the Holy Spirit as the comforter. In some of the newer translations, the, the same word is translated as a counselor. He's our counselor. He's our comforter. He's the one that stands beside us. He's the one who goes with us, uh, and, and he, he's right there with us. In John chapter 14, verse 26, it says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Then we also see that he is the convictor. He's the one that brings conviction to us. Uh, con- he's the convincer. He, he convinces us of things. In John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11, it says, When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in him. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And so we see these areas that the Holy Spirit is, is a convincer. He's, he's a convictor in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. When, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and some of you are very new Christians, and some are going to be baptized this morning that are very new Christians, and uh, you may remember that when the Word of God came to you, you felt something stirring within you, in your heart. It, it may have been, it, it could have felt like it was something painful that, that you didn't want to experience. Sometimes it's, there's just a, a gentle, almost like a tingle there, but you, can, you, you know that what is being said from the Word of God is for you. The plan of salvation is for you. And so those who do not believe, the Holy Spirit convicts them so that they will believe. He also convicts in regard to sin because, because Jesus is going to the Father. That's the source of our righteousness. And, and so in order for us to be able to have victory over sin, it must be Jesus that brings that forgiveness to us. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that forgives us our sin. And as believers in Jesus Christ, when we become a believer, we're not good. Only God is good. Jesus said that. Only God is good. But when we come to know Jesus as our Savior and we begin to follow him, God is within us. It's it's the righteousness of Christ. It's the goodness of the Holy Spirit within us that lives through us. We're not good. We're human beings. We were born in sin. We're broken people. But the presence of God within us brings righteousness 
into our lives. And then because of judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. We don't have to fear Satan because Jesus is greater than Satan. He's already been judged. In, in, in the realm of God's view of things, God is yesterday, today, and forever. He knows the past. He knows the future. He's in, experiencing it. And in God's economy, Satan has already been defeated. He's already been judged. He's already been thrown into the lake of fire. But in this world, we are still living out time and, and experiencing Satan. So he may come to tempt us. He may come to discourage us. Jesus said he comes to destroy but he has no power when we trust in Jesus because he is greater than Satan. And then the Holy Spirit is also our guide. How how do we know, um, again, many uh, of us new Christians, how do we know how to live? How do we we know what it means to, to, to be a Christian? The Holy Spirit is our guide in John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Often we don't emphasize the Holy Spirit enough. And part of the reason is because he does not come to promote himself. Uh, I think sometimes we can overemphasize the Holy Spirit and actually grieve the Spirit because his work is not to lift up himself. His work is to lift up Jesus. He comes to remind us of what Jesus has done. The Holy Spirit didn't die on the cross. Jesus did. It's not the Holy Spirit's blood that cleanses us. It's Jesus' blood that cleanses us. What the Holy Spirit does is to, he comes and guides us to Jesus. And he comes to, and he reminds us of what Jesus has said. He guides us in how to follow Jesus. It, it, it may seem overwhelming when someone comes to know Christ as their Savior. How am I ever going to live for God? How am I going to remember all these things? How am I going to do all, uh, you know, we look at believers who've been around the church for 40, 50 years. How am I ever going to do, live life the way they do? The Holy Spirit is there and he will guide you. He'll guide you into the word of God. He'll remind you of what the Holy Spirit has said. When you come to church and you hear the word of God being preached and you go into a group and and you hear the Bible being discussed, you know, you, you... you don't really always remember everything that you said but when, or that was said, but when the time comes that you need the word of God, the Holy Spirit is there to guide you and to remind you and to bring back to remembrance those things that uh, Jesus has said and what he wants us to do. He's also our intercessor, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Here again, I I don't know all the burdens that you bear. I don't know all the things that are on your heart and mind this morning. There are people who have lost loved ones who are very dear and very close to them. Uh, there, there are people who, who have lost a spouse and maybe have lived together for decades and they don't even know how they're going to go on with life. Uh, there may be physical problems. You may have gotten the word that you have cancer. You may be going through cancer treatments. It, it may seem uh, like the end is, has come. Uh, maybe broken relationships with, with uh, the spouse or with your children and, and you've poured so much love into that relationship and now there's a brokenness there. Uh, People come with all these different things, but I want you to know this morning that the Holy Spirit knows your need. And and as you pray, sometimes your mind may not even be able to comprehend what you ought to pray. You may not even know how you should pray, but the Holy Spirit, as you offer up your prayers, takes that need and interprets it to the Father for you on, on your behalf. He is our intercessor. The Holy Spirit existed as part of the Trinity from eternity past. He was involved in creation, as I already mentioned. He was active in the Old Testament. He became active with humanity in a different way, beginning at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit represents God in us since the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. 
In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came on particular people for a particular time for a particular task. If you look at the story, some of our, our great heroes of the Old Testament, you will, will find that it says, and the Spirit of, of God came upon them, or they were filled with, with, with the Spirit. But it was not as we experience it today. It was, it, it was not for everyone. It was because this person needed the Spirit to do what God wanted them to do at this particular point, and the Spirit came upon them, and they were able to, to accomplish a particular uh, uh, task and purpose for a specific period of time. But since Pentecost, he is available to every believer. The second thing that we want to notice is that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dynamics at Pentecost. Pentecost was a special day, and, and God worked in a special way on the day of Pentecost. And there was a dynamic change and each of the apostles on the day of Pentecost and following the day of Pentecost that, that, that we can learn from and, and that the Holy Spirit can, can meet with us. The first thing is courage, courage. If you were here on Easter Sunday, I, I preached about how after Jesus was nailed to the cross that the disciples were frightened. They, they, were, they were afraid and, and uh, they, they were discouraged. And, and they thought, well, if, if they took Jesus out and they hung him on the cross, uh, what are they going to do with us? And they went and hid in, in, in an upper room. And after Jesus ascended into heaven, Jesus said, don't, don't go outside of Jerusalem. And they went back into an upper room, and for 10 days they stayed there and prayed. These men that got it wrong so often when Jesus was on the earth, they didn't even understand what Jesus was saying. They were afraid for their lives, and and they were in the upper room. But after 10 days of prayer on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit filled them, and they became courageous. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I said. For, for Here are these men who, who had been afraid for, for so long, and now they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And you read all the rest of the New Testament, they became men of faith. They became bold. They were, get, they were giving out the gospel to people and people's lives are being transformed. And when persecution came, every one of the apostles, except for the apostle John, were, was killed. He, they were martyred for their faith. The apostle John was banished off on, on an island and died uh, at, a, at an old age. He's the only one that wasn't uh, was not killed for his faith, but they had courage. And, and a result of this was communication. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, it says, when the people heard this, that's important, when the people heard this, the message that, that came from them, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? The miracle that happened on Pentecost Sunday, the original Pentecost, was that the multilingual crowd heard the message in their own language. If you read the the verses there in Acts chapter 2, I'm not going to read all the verses there, but it says that people from every nation under heaven were there. It tells us in a list, names, many of these nations, people who came from different backgrounds, had, had different uh, uh, voices, different languages. They were in Jerusalem because they were Jewish, but they had been spread out in many different nations, and they spoke many different languages. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they spoke in other tongues, which was actually even practiced in other religions, uh, at the time, they they would would speak in in tongues in in other in other languages. But the miracle was here were these people who were there from all different parts of the world, speaking many different languages, and they could hear the message in their own language. A miracle. Here here are these apostles who later were testified of that they were common and ordinary people. 
They didn't study and learn all these different languages. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke in these languages, and people understood what it was, and each heard them speaking in their own language. What was the purpose that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come? And we're going to talk about it in a couple minutes, Acts 1.8. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The, the, the purpose of the Holy Spirit in us is to give us courage to speak up and the ability to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ so that lives can be transformed. And then conviction. We talked about the Holy Spirit being the convictor. And this happened uh, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When the people heard this, the message of Peter and the apostles, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They had that sense of conviction within them. They, they, they realized their own need, and they asked Peter what they should do. This is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit or the convincing power of the Holy Spirit. And then conversion. On Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, those accepted his message and were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And every pastor in every church ever since has longed for the day when they would see 3,000 people come to the Lord on the same day. I, th- we, I think everybody who, who, who preaches the gospel would like to see that happen. And you know, you know the good news? In the world today, more than 3,000 people will come to know Jesus Christ as, as the gospel goes out in many languages around the world there will be people who will come to Christ. But I, I was still trying to apply it to Calvary Wesleyan Church. You just think, if three people every week would come to know Christ as their Savior, that would be 150 new Christians in a year. That would double, almost double the size of our congregation. Wouldn't that be something to pray for? Lord, just give us three just give us three. Do it 50 times in a year. Just give us three. We'll, we'll, we'll be happy with three, not 3,000. But I'd love to see that be our prayer. Lord, every week, give us three who come to know Jesus as their Savior. And then there was the sense of community. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, after the day of Pentecost, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 3,000 in one day, that was just the start. It wasn't long in the book of Acts. They were talking about 5,000. And then they stopped even counting. They just said there were multitudes that came to know Christ as Savior. And, and the community, the sense of community that they had, it says that, that they met together every day. They went to the temple and they met in each other's homes and they shared everything together. Now, it, that didn't last very long as the church grew and went very, you know, out into, into the world. It got to be too big. But, I, but just think about this. Wouldn't it be awesome if someone would figure out a way to get small groups of Christians to get together and somebody would open up their home and eight or ten people would come to their home and fellowship together and share together and uh, take, take the, word, the word of God together in somebody's home. And, and maybe, maybe they could be called small groups. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing? And, and if a church would hire somebody, that that's what they did was to get people in small groups. That would be wonderful. Well, that's what we do here. Thank you, Roger, for, for doing that. But, you know, we haven't practiced that. You know, established churches for many years didn't practice that. But it's time we do. It's time that somebody says, I'll open up my home. I'll open up my home. Thank you for those who did that in the war room, but we need to open up enough homes that everybody in the church can be part of a small group. It's the practice of how they kept the community going in the book of Acts after the day of Pentecost. 
And then the work of the Holy Spirit in believers. First is power. Jesus said in, in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The, the power of the wind that we saw on the day of Pentecost represents the power. Wind has great power. Uh, we've seen lately some of the tornadoes, and from time to time we hear about great hurricanes and the damage that, that great winds uh, can do, the power, uh, and, and, and the power that can come. One of the greatest indictments against the modern churches of America is the condition in which our nation is in. Where's the power to be his witnesses? Why do we not have more of an impact? You know, we have all kinds of material things. We have all kinds of technology. We have all kinds of sound systems. We've got the internet. We've got the television. We've got, you know, just on and on and on. We've got, we've got, we've got, but what we lack is the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit will give us power to make a difference in this culture in which we live, in this world in which we live today. It's no use longing for the old days, the, the, the golden days, the, the, the good old days. They're in the past. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in 2016 to reach the people of this world with the gospel of today and see transform lives. And then there's production that comes from the, the Holy Spirit being in our lives. The, the first thing that's produced is, are the gifts of the Spirit. There are a variety of gift lists in the Bible. There's some that Paul wrote in, in uh, Romans. There's some that he wrote in 1 Corinthians and other places where the gifts of the Spirit are given. And in, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 and 11, uh, he, he talks about them. Matter of fact, if you read all of those verses in between, he's listing out some of them and giving characteristics of them and how, how all of those work together as in a body, like different parts of our body function in different ways, the gifts. But in 4, he introduces it, and in 11, he brings it to, kind of to a conclusion there. And he says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. And all these are the work of one and the same spirit, And he gives them to each one just as he determines. And so everyone has gifts. When you come to know Christ as Savior, not just your talents, not just the things that you've learned in a trade or or, or in a profession, but he gives you a spiritual gift. And we should not look at other people and say, oh, my gift's better than yours, so I'm more spiritual than you. And, And we shouldn't look at somebody else and say, well, I got stuck with this gift, I want that gift. No, the Holy Spirit chooses to give us the gift that he wants us to have. And as we come together then as the body, all the gifts that are necessary for the body of Christ to be the church in this world are among us. None of us have have it all. The church is not just the pastor. The church is not just the pastoral staff or the local board of administration. We all, everyone who knows Christ as Savior has a gift of the Spirit. We need to discover that gift and use that gift for the glory of God. That's the body of Christ functioning together in a healthy way. And then the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, it says, But the Spirit, excuse me, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. These are things that not, not, you know, there are some people that are just nice. They may not be godly. They may not even be believers in Christ, but they're just nice people. That, that is not what this is talking about. This is the fruit of the Spirit because we have the Holy Spirit in us. These attributes flow out of us because of the Holy Spirit being in us. And then proclamation, going back again to Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are to take the gospel with us into our homes, into our neighborhoods, into our schools, in the places we're employed, in our broader communities, in our cities, across our nation, and around the world, we are to be the witnesses for Jesus Christ through the power 
of the Holy Spirit. And while these things took place on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit still fills his people today. When you, became, when, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. He comes into your life when you choose to follow Jesus. However, your sin nature struggles within you against the Holy Spirit. We, we were born broken. We were born with a, with a sinful nature within us. And we come to a point as a believer where we recognize we cannot overcome sin in our lives in our own strength, and we must give ourselves over to God. Your responsibility and my responsibility as a believer is to consecrate yourself to God, and God responds by filling you with the Holy Spirit. You become spirit-controlled or spirit-driven rather than self or sin-driven. You see, when you come to Christ, your focus is on the past. I've lived in sin. These, these things, uh, I need to have this forgiven. I've not been living as a believer in you. And so we look to the past and we say, these things need to be forgiven when we come to Christ. But after we're a believer, we begin to recognize that within us, there's something that's just a a, a drawing towards sin. There's a propensity towards sin. And we need a filling of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to fill our lives and, and to change our lives. And we do that by consecrating ourselves to him. We We cannot... We cannot generate the Holy Spirit within ourselves. We just consecrate ourselves to God, and God fills us with His Spirit. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Another term with being, uh, another term that, that means being filled with the Spirit is to be baptized with the Spirit. And today we're going to have baptism. And there are, there are four people who want to make a public profession of faith. What a wonderful thing today on Pentecost Sunday as we baptize new believers. What a wonderful thing it would be for believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe your spirit is dry. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you feel beaten down. Maybe you can't even uh, sense God in your life. What a wonderful today, today to just simply say, God, I know I'm your child. I know Jesus has forgiven me but I just do not have the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I want to consecrate myself to you and have your Holy Spirit fill me. When, when we ask people to give their life to Jesus and to begin to follow Jesus, we don't ask for a, you to stand up. We don't want to embarrass anybody or, or anything, and we, we pray a prayer, and you, you, you give a card to indicate that, you've been pray, uh, that you have prayed th- that prayer. But, you know, I'm talking to believers right now, And you shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you all across this room, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and you want a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. You want to consecrate your life to Christ. Maybe you've done this before, but this morning you feel a, you feel a need. You, you, you feel like these characteristics of the Holy Spirit are not in your life. You're, you're, you don't have the power to be witnesses. You don't have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You're not using your spiritual gifts, any of these things. Maybe you just don't feel close to God, even though you know you're a believer. I'd like for you to just stand up right where you are right now, and I want to pray for you right now. All across the room, I believe that there are believers here today that need the filling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. We'll just pause for a moment. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your love and grace in our lives. We thank you that that your grace covers our sin and that Jesus has forgiven us of our sin. But Lord, as we live out our lives, we can become so enamored with the things of the world and our, our minds are attracted to material things and the things of this world. Perhaps there's been difficulties that have come in our lives and 
maybe we haven't felt as close to you as we would like to, or, or we've missed opportunities to be your witnesses because we didn't have the courage to, to stand up and to say what needed to be said. Lord, I pray today for each of these that are standing before you this morning. They're your children. They love you. They're following you, but they need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. Lord, I pray that even in this moment, that they would be filled with your Holy Spirit and that the evidence of that Spirit would be a changed life, that even as believers, they would be transformed and that they would have new courage and new boldness and, and a new power to communicate the gospel and that people would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior through these who are standing. And Lord, may your church be able to make a difference in this world, even in this post-Christian era in America. May we see revival and spiritual awakening because your children have sought your power and Holy Spirit in their lives. May you be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.